Hello, beloveds, and welcome to Christian Emotional Recovery, a podcast for those who are survivors of childhood trauma, emotional neglect, and narcissistic abuse. This podcast is hosted by Rachel Leroy, a college professor and trauma survivor. Many of us spend years trying to heal and don't get anywhere. We don't always target the trauma itself, which is so often what keeps us stuck. This podcast is where faith meets science. Rachel is an emotional healing expert with 20 years of experience applying healing modalities that helped her start making progress after nothing else worked. She'll show you how to do the same. Each week, we'll cover a topic that will show you how to heal trauma for good. Please check out our website and show notes at christianemotionalrecovery.com and join the Facebook community, Trauma Survivors Unite Christian Emotional Recovery. Thank you so much for tuning in to this week's episode of Christian Emotional Recovery, hosted by Rachel Leroy. For links to this week's resources and to join the discussion, check out this episode's show notes at christianemotionalrecovery.com, where you can also find links to our YouTube channel and Facebook group. Join our email list and get other episodes and resources. If you enjoyed the podcast, please rate and review the podcast and tell a friend who may benefit from this message. See you next time. And remember, beloveds, God loves you, and you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Episode 2 of Season 3 of Christian Emotional Recovery. I'm your host, Rachel Leroy, and as always, it is a wonderful privilege to be here with you today, to go on this journey of healing with you, and to be able to educate you and empower you to take your life back, to live the life that God intended you to live, and to heal trauma and other forms of emotional and abuse-type situations and issues. This episode, in this episode, we are going to talk about how internal family systems can help you heal trauma. And it's called How Internal Family Systems Can Help You Heal Trauma. Now, if you're not familiar with that term, it's not a literal family system, but it's a form of therapy and a form of healing work that can allow you to help you heal your trauma and other emotional issues. And maybe you've heard of um, internal family systems, maybe not. It started off as a form of therapy that people mainly did with therapists and especially cognitive and talk therapists in their offices and people have actually started doing it on their own and it's been found to have a lot of success. So we're going to talk about that today and we'll talk about what IFS, internal family systems is IFS is and its origins. We'll talk about how it's broken down, how it works, the nature and principles of IFS. We'll talk about what it treats. In other words, how can it help me? Can you do it on your own? Should Christians do IFS. I'll share you a little bit my experience with IFS because I've used it both in a therapist's office or I should say telehealth and um, on my own. And we'll go through some exercises and talk about those that you can do on your own as well. And we'll talk about resources to get started on IFS. Now, just a reminder, um, If you haven't checked it out, check out the YouTube channel. The YouTube channel is getting started a little late this year because I have a heavy teaching load. Yes, I got a heavy teaching load on top of working on my business. If you saw, um, listen to the first um, podcast of the year, that was not a numbered podcast, but just an update on the new season. You'll know that I'm working on building a store for my writing courses, and that's a lot of work. And it's also, um, I'm also putting my Christian Emotional Recovery Channel store there as well. So if you see it lumped in with the writing stuff, please forgive me, but the payment to have two different um, accounts is too much right now. So I'm putting those together and I hope you'll forgive me and maybe you're interested in the writing courses as well. But I will put the store, right now I just have the meditation set of the Acorn for Etiquette 
um, acorn meditations there. Go check that out. The acorn meditations are $12. You have access to them anytime you want. So even if you're, you don't have access to the internet, you can download them. And that's a good reason to buy them when, when and if you just want to have access to them anytime you want. They are on YouTube, but you're also supporting the podcast. I have been facing increasing challenges to keep up with the finances and the increasing expenses of the podcast and the demands on my time and energy. So anything that you can do to help out and also to get something wonderful in return to help you on your healing journey is appreciated. So check that out in the show notes. I will link it below. Check out the YouTube channel if you haven't. The YouTube channel has things that you can't get in the um, episodes here. They are exclusive to the YouTube channel in most cases. I do put this episode and all the other episodes in the YouTube channel, but there is stuff there that you can't get anywhere else. It's shorter talks about more specialized topics of healing trauma, of resources that can help you heal um, in emotional recovery, and other tools that and techniques you can use to help you heal trauma and abuse. So those are some things to keep in mind. Check out the Facebook group if you haven't. All of this is linked below. And also keep in mind that I'm on Instagram as well. I'm on Instagram. I have Monday memes that are shared in the Facebook group and in the Instagram channel. And I plan on expanding and growing the store soon, so stay tuned more for that. But let's go ahead and jump in and get started straight on internal family systems and how it can help you heal trauma. Now, the first thing that I want to talk about, I don't want to just bring up all these abstract therapies and then just, you know, like to hear myself talk about them. That's not the point of this episode or this podcast. Internal family systems is a dynamic, research-tested, experience-tested therapy that you can do with a therapist and or on your own to help you heal trauma and to help you heal trauma at its root in a very specific way. It focuses on the emotional and the thought or intellectual side of it because a lot of times with trauma you need to focus more on that body based work. So you're focused on your body and your thoughts at the same time when you do internal family systems work. But first I wanted to read, um, I'll be reading off of a lot of articles today so please bear with me. Um, These are some great resources and I will put all the resources in the show notes. I always credit authors. I'm an English teacher. I have a big thing about plagiarism and crediting authors and honesty and all that. And those sources can also be articles you can go and read so you can review and learn a little bit more about IFS on your own how it can help you, and how you can actually put it into practice if it's something that you want to try, okay? So first, what is IFS and what are its origins? So IFS is Internal Family Systems. IFS is Internal Family Systems. And I have an article here that is called Internal Family Systems Therapy. It's in Psychology Today, and it was, um, I don't know if there's an author here. It was reviewed by Psychology Today staff. And I don't see an author. They usually put an author. But anyway, um, that is the source. And basically, it says, quoting it from the article, Internal Family Systems, IFS, is an approach to psychotherapy that identifies and addresses multiple subpersonalities or families within each person's mental system. These subpersonalities consist of wounded parts and painful emotions such as anger and shame and parts that try to control and protect the person from the pain of the wounded parts. The subpersonalities are often in conflict with each other and with one's core self, a concept that describes the confident, compassionate whole person that is at the core of every individual, and I do believe that. IFS focuses on healing the wounded parts and restoring mental balance and harmony by changing the dynamic like in a family and how they all relate, that create discord among the subpersonalities of the self. Now, this is me. A couple of things about this. One, it sounds kind of crazy at first. And I don't use that term to describe a person with multiple personality disorders. I just mean the concept itself sounds kind of crazy because it sounds like you have multiple personalities. And you. It, one thing, if you do have some kind of multiple personality issue then this is probably not the best therapy for you. And if you've done a lot of therapy and you have that condition, you know that probably. But um, for anybody else, it does seem to be, for most people, it seems to be a good therapeutic way to heal. And we'll talk more about how do you actually do that 
And um, just a couple of things, though. No, it does not mean that you have multiple personalities in the traditional sense. Like, you've got a seven-year-old girl named Sarah that's bashful, and then you've got a 40-year-old guy named Randy that likes to beat people up. That's not what it's talking about here. But if you think about things, even if you think about how you talk, there are times when you're conflicted about something and you'll say, well, a part of me wants to do this, but another part wants to do that. Those are the literal parts that we're talking about. We all have these different patterns and parts of ourselves, and they can be different ages. Like one of them, like I said, it, not literal personalities, but one of them could be seven years old. And the other one could be, if you're a 60-year-old woman, could be your 50-year-old self and whatever happened to you at that time and how that formed you. And you get all these complex emotions and thoughts and parts, and those start to interact and they p come together to create the whole you, so to speak. And we'll come back to that in just a minute, but I just wanted to distinguish the difference between having actual multiple personality um, conditions and the parts that we're talking about here in the average person. Now it says, IFS was developed by a psychologist, Richard Schwartz. I've done some of his meditations. I've read his book. He's, a, he's got good stuff. It says, in his work as a family therapist, Schwartz began to observe patterns in how people describe their inner lives. What I heard repeatedly were descriptions of what they often called their parts, quote, the conflicted pers subpersonalities that resided within them, Schwartz says. He began to conceive of the mind as a family. That's where the family part comes from, not the family we think of as like mom, dad, son, daughter, or whatever those dynamics may be, but I just put out the most traditional one, so to speak. And then the parts of as family members interacting with one another. Exploring how these components functioned with one another was the foundation for IFS and the idea of the core self. So that's a little bit about what IFS is and how it functions and where it came from. When it's used, it says IFS therapy can treat individuals, couples, and families. So it can be used in a family, but it has to be used on the individual level, if that makes sense. It can effectively treat a variety of conditions and symptoms. They include depression, anxiety, panic, phobias, trauma, substance abuse, physical health conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis, your thoughts towards that, and general functioning and well-being. IFS may not be appropriate for patients with severe mental illness that involve psychosis or paranoia such as schizophrenia. Describing a person as having parts may be unproductive or harmful to those patients. So if that's you, um, this Therapy may not be the best for you, and I would consult a licensed professional who cares about your well-being before you try this if you fit into those categories, okay? Not that we're categorizing you as only those things. Obviously not. You're much more than that. So in 2015, it says IFS was designated as an evidence-based practice on the National Registry for Evidence-Based Programs and Practices, a database created by the U.S. Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. So this is a recognized form of therapy. And it says, for example, a small randomized control trial found that IFS could help with pain, physical functioning, depressive symptoms, and self-compassion in rheumatoid arthritis patients. And as we know from experience, that doesn't irrefutably prove that it'll work in every situation, but it's indicative that it probably does. And based on my experience, based on other people's experiences, and based on a lot of therapists' experiences and other studies, it does. Another found that IFS was effective in treating depression symptoms um, among a sample of young women. So I would presume that it would work with men and people of other genders as well. Still, IFS does not have a strong, um, as strong of an evidence base as other forms of therapy. But that's just because it's new. That's my belief. That's because it's new. Now, a little bit more about IFS, what it is, how it functions, how it can help people. There is a Psych Central article, and the Psych Central article talks about, um, it's called, What is IFS, Internal Family Systems Therapy? And it is by Hope Gillette, Gillette and Lori Lawrence, Psych D., um, reviewed it. It says, 
Internal Family Systems Therapy, also known as IFS therapy or internal family systems, is a type of psychotherapy developed by an academic named Richard Schwartz, and he's a therapist. Schwartz believed that the mind works in the same way as a family unit. This is why he incorporated some traditional models and techniques used in family systems therapy that's already been established into his own psychotherapy approach. Instead of a singular personality, Schwartz suggested everyone deals with an under undetermined amount of subpersonalities. These subpersonalities are overseen by a core governing entity known as the self. We all have parts, he says, unique subpersonalities within our minds, and these parts have beliefs, hopes, and burdens. So you see how those function and can function together to interact like people would. Um, but this is explained by Clarissa Hartwell, a clinical social worker in... I cannot pronounce that. Forgive me. Somewhere in California. Anyway. So what is family systems? In a nutshell, family systems therapy views family units as a whole instead of seeing a family as a group of people. Um, each person in the family is part of the unit. And those how those parts interact with each other determines the overall health of the family system. We're talking about within yourself with all those parts. Schwartz applied this approach to his internal family systems therapy. Okay, so that's a little bit about what IFS is and how it works. Now, let's break down how this functions. When you understand how it breaks down, then you can see how you can apply it to yourself. And we're going to talk about some specific steps you can take and some specific um, exercises you can do. And I will put the resources in the show notes so you can go back to those and actually do the exercises with those resources to help you. Okay, so a breakdown of different parts and self um, you might even be asking, what are you talking about? Well, you probably understand what parts are to a degree, but let's talk about it some more and talk about what self is. So I'm back in the Psychology Today article, and the Psychology Today talks about what to expect. And it says, IFS is talk therapy in which you work with a therapist. So this is when you're with the therapist, but you would do the same on your own if you were on your own. You would work with a therapist to identify and understand the specific subpersonalities or families that make up your internal mental system. Once you identify these parts, the therapist will help you acknowledge your feelings about these suppressed emotions. Learn how to release these feelings so you are freer to address the actual problem, and that's what it's all about, and ultimately find more positive ways to manage conflicts on your own. So it's a realistic way of coming to a more positive um, way of looking at things. It says the therapist may suggest certain tools to help you do this, such as relaxation exercises, visualization, keeping a journal, or creating a chart that illustrates the relationships between self, that's you, and the different parts of you. According to the IFS mo um, model, parts often play three common roles. Now, this is where you really want to understand what the parts are so you can understand how they interact. These are established terms that all IFS trained professionals use and the ones that you would want to stick to um, if you do this with yourself. Okay, the first one is managers. This is These are parts. Managers are protective parts that function to control people's surroundings and manage emotions and tasks to navigate daily life. So you've got those parts of yourself that try to protect other parts. And then exiles are parts that hold hurt, fear, or shame from early experiences, and they carry the difficult emotions and memories associated with those experiences. Managers aim to keep exiles contained and hidden from conscious awareness to avoid distress and pain. So managers are not there to be pushy or to cause more hurt, even though that is often what happens. They're there to try to protect the exiles. And if you have an inner, you've heard of inner child work, you've heard of your inner child, and your inner child can be all these different ages. I would argue that exiles often, though not always, you can have happy, healthy parts of your inner child. But a lot of times the exiles are your inner child's or children or and or they are your um, earlier experiences of trauma. And that's what a lot of those younger parts are that need protecting. It's the hurt parts that need protecting, right? So that's why it's often difficult to heal because you've got this resistance inside of you and it's the managers that are trying to protect you. Their motives are good and sometimes they serve a purpose, but sometimes they can get in the way. And that's why IFS is so effective. It helps you to work with those, not force, 
not try to change, but work with those and try to get those to step back so you can talk to and work with your exiles. Now, the third role or the third type of part is the firefighter. This is the one that might not be as healthy, but it's also a part of who you are. And in understanding and showing compassion to all these parts, not forcing, not pushing, not fighting, is the strategy that you use, just like if you were in a family. How do you negotiate with your mother, your father, your son, your daughter, your brother, your sister, as long as they're not completely insane in the membrane or something like that, you use um, persuasion. You reason with them. You talk to them. You show compassion. You listen. That's how families, ideally, we know some, a lot of us haven't experienced that, but that's how they interact. But within yourself, you have power over that. You have control over that. You can't control what your mom does or what your son does or what your sister does. You can control what you do, though. And you might not be able to control all these parts, but you can control how you respond to them. So the third one is firefighters. And firefights are activated when exiles produce overwhelming, painful, and threatening emotions. For example, if you get triggered or you have a PTSD flashback. And um, it says fire, firefights aim to inhibit those difficult emotions by any means necessary excuse me, such as substance abuse or binge eating. So this is where people disassociate and use unhealthy coping mechanisms. And so it's trying to protect you again, like the manager, but maybe in a way that's not as healthy. And so you have to deal with those issues to get to the root problems as well. But there has to be a gentle and kind and safe approach to it. And that's what IFS is. So it says, to take an example, an exiled part may be the trauma and anger of earlier abuse. These emotions are suppressed by the manager, and the firefighter may be an addiction to alcohol, which distracts the person from facing and re-experiencing those difficult emotions. IFS also posits that everyone has a core self. This is important. The self is you. And that's a little hard to wrap your mind around. When I first started thinking about the concept of self, I'm like, I'm just me. My emotions, my all this, all this stuff is me. But the self is not all of those things. You are not your fear. You are not your anger. You are not your trauma. You are the perfect whole being that God created you to be. And underneath all of that sin and trauma and hurt is still that core self that is untouched. That's a tabula rasa or a blank slate. That, does that make sense? So the self has many positive traits, according to Schwartz's model. And he has a model, and it includes eight C's and five P's. The presence of these traits can identify how much of the self is available at a given time and how much of the self may still need to emerge. So those parts, a lot of times, can suppress the self, your true self, who you really are, your core goodness that God made you. So um, the self may still need to emerge. And that's why you work with the parts to help the self to come out. And it's the self that talks to those parts and manages in them. And that's what a healthy, well-integrated whole person does. The, all that stuff comes together and it works as one. Even though there are individual parts still, it's cohesive and it integrates. And that's what a whole person does. And it says the eight C's are confidence, calmness, creativity, clarity, curiosity, courage, compassion, and connectedness. Those are the five, the eight C's of self-leadership, of self-leadership, that special word self here. And then the five P's, and you know that the self is working when all of these qualities are, or some of these qualities are at work. It says presence, patience, perspective, persistence, and playfulness. So that is how the self and the parts relate to one another, how they function, and how they work when they're unhealthy or when they're healthy. Okay? A little bit more about the self, though. I just want you to understand, really understand what the self is. And it's something that is through mental exercise, through calming your mental chatter, through meditation and prayer, through sitting with your emotions, where you find that place where you're observing your emotions, where you're being objective, the place you're coming from to that, that's yourself. And the more you go there, the more you'll know what self is versus not self. Does that make sense? It's, it's kind of weird. It's kind of abstract. 
It sounds a little woo-woo, but it's really not because it's been tested by brain science. It's been tested by a lot of different therapies. So um, just a little bit more about the self because I think this is the central concept here. And keep in mind, I'm not talking about being self-centered or self-absorbed, but every healthy person in the world has a strong sense of self. That doesn't mean that they're self-absorbed. It doesn't mean that they're selfish. It just means that they know who they are and they know the difference between the things inside of them that can hurt and them, that eternal thing that has all of those qualities that embodies the fruits of the Spirit, which are very similar to the eight C's that I um, read, right? So in Psych Central, it says, How IFS Understands the Self. Internal Family Systems Therapy states that everyone has a self. If it's your center, that part of you that feels secure, relaxed, and receptive. Your self is the part of you that all other parts look to for direction. And then it says, self is in IFS is inherent within each of us and can be viewed as our true nature, our seat of consciousness, our deep inner knowing, says Harwell. This is somebody they're quoting. Some see self as our spirit or spiritual center. So it might be that sense of identity in Christ that God gave us. It's that core of who we are, that consciousness of that. So if we were made in the image of God, our body would be like Christ. If um, our mind, our higher functioning center would be like God. We're not God. I'm just making the comparison that we're made in his likeness. And so our spirit and our consciousness would be like the Holy Spirit. That's like the, the, the nudge that tells us what we're doing and where we're doing it and where we reflect and how we do it and all that, right? So the IFS, um, IFS sees the self as part of the part of you that remains constant. It doesn't change. Just like God, if we're made in his image, there would be something in us that is also constant, right? So no matter what subpersonalities a person may require, your core self is always the same. And the self is in command, it will determine what parts get listened to or shut out depending on the circumstances. It can also be critical for returning your parts to a state of equilibrium. So it's the part that manages all that other stuff. And it says, by using our self, capitalized, we can help our parts release burdens that have been accumulated through trauma or life experiences, thereby allowing the parts to take roles that better serve them and us, Harwell says. So the goal of the self is not to destroy parts, not even the firefighters and the managers, but to manage them and integrate them. So if you're um, abusing, say, television because you've got a lot of anxiety and you're numbing out, I'm guilty of that, so that's why I mentioned that one. Um, then you might get to the root of some anxiety and cut back on the television watching and yourself allows that firefighter part to kind of step back a little bit as you start to feel more secure about whatever specific anxiety might be triggering a week of binge watching Netflix for 20 hours straight. So you get the idea. That's just a silly example, but it works. You know, it's, it's what a lot of us go through. So that's a little bit about the self and the parts. Now, uh, breaking down um, IFS a little more, there are the five P's. I um, listed those. The eight C's, I listed those. And those are the qualities of the self. But then there's also something called the F six F's. The six F's. There's a lot of letters and numbers here. But um, transitioning from understanding the self, um, transitioning from that, the eight C's of self-leadership. I wanted to go into a little more detail about this whole quality of the self and what it in, entails and how you know the self is at work versus some of the parts. Um, that's the qualities of the self in the foundation uh, IFS article. So there's another article and it's the foundation IFS article. And I have a Microsoft Word document here. It's actually um, also a PDF and I will link this article in here as well. And it's the eight C's of self-leadership will. I don't want to get too complicated with this, but you can see the will, you can see the eight C's, and so if you want to break down the qualities of the self more, you can look to these to help you to do it. Now, I'm not going to go over all of this because it's, it's, it's a whole page. It's not that much, but you might want to read it. Calmness, serenity regarding regardless of circumstances. I'm just reading part of this. 
Clarity, the ability to perceive situations accurately without distortion from extreme beliefs and emotions. In other words, objectivity. Curiosity, a strong desire to know and learn something about a topic, situation, or person in a non-judgmental way. So curiosity is without fear. Compassion, be open-heartedly present and appreciative of others and one's self without feeling the urge to fix, change, distance, or judge. And so if you look at these qualities and then you start looking at the ACORN meditations that I put out and the ACORN um, acronym that you can go through to process difficult emotions, these qualities are the same and the steps are pretty much the same. Confidence, to maintain the ability to stay fully present in a situation and effectively handle or repair anything that happens, that takes practice. So if you're not good at that, be patient with yourself. You will get better as you practice in meditation, in therapy, in journaling, in reflecting, and so forth and so on. Courage, strength in the face of threat, challenge, or danger. Creativity, the use of the imagination to produce original ideas and connectedness, the state of feeling a part of a larger entity, such as a partnership, team, community, or organization. It might be with yourself. It might be with friends. It might be with a community of common healers. It might be a community, Christian community. It might be connectedness with God. And so connectedness can mean many things, of course, as you know. So we've talked about the... Um, eight C's a little more, and the nature and principles of IFS a little bit, but let's talk about that a little bit more as well. There's the self-leadership will, and there's also the five P's, and I wanted to just go into each one of those in a very, very brief detail. There's another article here, I'm linking it, and it's called Model. It's a, it's just a chart, and it's the five P's to successful self leadership. So those were the eight C's. This is the five P's. Perspective is the feeling of control that you control how you feel um, over your life. The key to effective self management is to accept responsibility for your own success for, or failure, and to work towards changing things that hinder your path towards success. Purpose without knowing where. You are going, you lack direction, so you will arrive, but you will um, where you arrive will be a matter of circumstance and not your choice. Know what direction you want to take and set goals and actions to keep yourself on track. Setting goals, right? Personality has two significant factors affecting self-management, assertiveness and receptiveness. Assertiveness can be defined as being pleasantly direct. Receptiveness is being open to the feedback of others. Planning refers to your skills of time and task management, and leaders must be able to plan their own time effectively and prioritize their own tasks, including within yourself, right, and in your own life. Productivity is the last one, and that refers to the utility of the time that you spend at work. These are qualities of the self, all of these things that a healthy self does. Productivity can be destroyed by factors such as indecision, procrastination, self-overload, interruptions, and generally inefficient work practices. So I'm using a work model here, but it's the same model that you would use with yourself, right? You don't have to look at yourself as a business or a business model, and you don't have to use all these terms. But the concept Concepts pretty much of practicing your healing work and living a day-to-day -day life as healthy and productive as you begin to heal is pretty much the same ideas. That's really true. So actually that model works. I'll put that in the show notes as well. Um, now we're <laughs> going in a lot of detail here because I really want you to understand this. When I first started doing and studying IFS, I didn't even think it would work. And I thought it was kind of crazy. And it took me a little while to wrap my mind around it. On the surface, it seemed simple, but the practice of it was a little tricky. So if you do this, you know, it might be good if you did it with an IFS therapist or found some courses, and, you know, look at these resources and use them in practice and you'll get better at it, okay? Okay, so the Psych Central article, the Psych Central article 
basic IFS assumptions and principles. So it's important to understand when you do IFS work, the nature of it. How does it work? What spirit do you do it in? What attitude do you have towards this whole process? And it, here are five principles. It says the mind is naturally subdivided into parts or subpersonalities. The subpersonalities compose the self, and self here is always capitalized. And self leads to internal systems that's made up of subpersonalities. There are no bad subpersonalities. IFS doesn't pretend to eliminate any part, but rather help them find a non extreme role that does not impact the whole system. Subpersonalities develop as you grow, forming complex interactions among themselves, like a family, but systems can be reorganized, and when this happens, parts and interactions change too. Number five, internal self and external environment systems affect each other, so when one changes, the other one will tend to do so too. So that's a little bit about the nature of IFS and how everything comes together. How does it work in therapy? What are the benefits of it? How does it help you? And what does it treat? Those are things that will help you to understand how it directly relates to you, where you're at, what you're doing in your life on your healing journey. Um, so let's look at that a little bit. Um, the Very Well Mind article, I'm looking at a section called What to Expect. The Very Well Mind article, I'm looking at a section called What to Expect. And this is, if you're in a therapy session with your therapist, how exactly does your therapist work with you to do these steps? How does it actually work in practice? And that's a good, that's a, that's a good question. So it says... So it says your first session of IFS therapy will often cover basic information about the process and an internal assessment, your parts. Your therapist will ask background questions that will help them better understand what you need to help with and what you hope to get out of therapy. The therapeutic relationship is essential for success of therapy, so it is important to build a comfortable, trusting rapport with your therapist. And then it says during subsequent sessions, you will work with your therapist to identify the parts of the self and build connections between all of these components. Each session often involves talk therapy and explores the inner parts of an individual. An individual is encouraged to focus on the inner self, so it is normal sometimes to experience discomfort, fear, shame, or anger. That's part of the process. You're working through that stuff, so that's okay. And it says your therapist will help you manage these feelings and learn how to deal with such feelings in healthier ways. And what can IFS therapy help? It can help anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, major depressive disorder, bipolar disorder, disassociative identity disorder, I hate the word disorder, eating disorder, and substance abuse disorders. In other words, conditions. All of those conditions. I like that word better. Research also suggests that IFS therapy shows promise as a treatment for trauma. So that's good, right? And if it helps all those other things, I would say it probably does help trauma. So, and it says, a study in 2021 found that IFS therapy led to significant decreases in PTSD symptoms in adults who had experienced childhood traumas. So, that's great news. This is why it's relevant to you. This is why it can help you. So, what are the benefits? These are the things that can make better things that um, cause problems, but what are the positives? So, it says, in a study of college-aged women with moderate to severe Depression, researchers found IFS therapy to have the following benefits. Gives them power through self-leadership and achieving internal balance. Promotes self-compassion. Helps them view depression symptoms as normal reactions to stressors or trauma rather than a diagnosis. The thing about IFS is that it doesn't focus on your diagnosis. It focuses more on what's causing your problems. And then it provides a better understanding of self and prepares you for emotional difficulties that might occur in the future. So those are some of the um, benefits of IFS, internal family systems, as well. Now, how do you put all this into practice if you want to do this on your own? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, so can you do this on your own is also a good question. So let's, let's talk about that. Um, can you do this on your own? Yes, you can. I've done IFS work on my own. My therapist has encouraged me to. 
I currently have a therapist who specializes in IFS, and I kind of tripped upon this therapy by accident because I was looking up therapists, and I wanted to start back going to therapy. Um, I don't want to get into things that are too personal, but I had one therapist, and for reasons that were not good, I decided to let that therapist go that it wasn't working and there were some things that they said and did that I realized were abusive and I said no more and I cut them off and um, so I looked for a new therapist and um, this therapist was an IFS therapist but they were highly rated he was highly rated and I've been going to him for several years and he's wonderful and so um, this is how I learned about this strategy and as I started working with him then I started doing this on my own and um, so, yes, you can do it on your own. And um, if you have extreme ther um, trauma, you may want to speak to a professional before you try it. I always put that disclaimer out there. But this isn't one where I feel like it's dangerous per se. But you just want to be careful because IFS work can be a little tricky, especially at first because it's kind of complicated and kind of involved in some ways. But, so how do you actually do this, like on your own? How do you do this? Well, I will put a couple of resources in the um, show notes that will help you do that. One of them is the six steps, and it's the six steps of IFS, bleh, sorry, the six steps of IFS process to jumpstart healing. That's a weird title. The six steps that we use to help protective parts differentiate from the self. And that's what it's all about. You go through these six steps. You can do it in a meditation. You can do it in a reflection. You can do it in a journal. You can do it um, by recording yourself talking. Maybe keep that recording private somewhere. You can do it in a therapy session. And so there's several formats you could use to go through this process. And the six F's, remember I mentioned the C's and the P's. Well, these are the F's, but these are the steps you actually go through. And this is also how you can do this on your own. So I'm kind of overlapping the section here that are exercises you can do with um, my experiences and can you do it on your own. Um, but the six F's are, um, the first three steps are find focus and flesh out and it involves helping parts to unblend with the self and so um, the first one is find the part in on or around the body so you might be like well which part how do I know which part to address find out what is most prevalent find out what's coming up for you find out what's most urgent and needs work the most if it helps you may want to review the acorn meditation or the acorn um the acorn um, strategy, and then you can apply some of what you learned from the acorn strategy to this. But I don't want I don't want to get this too complicated. But finding what needs the most attention now is one of the steps of the acorn meditation. So find the part that needs the most attention now. That I made that part up. Who needs your attention right now, or what? Where do you notice it? So. There's a part of the acorn meditation where I ask you to feel into your body. Where do you feel sensations when you think about that particular issue, emotion, or energy in your body? The thing that's coming up and needs your attention the most. Then you tune into your body. Do you see how this is body work? And you um, turn your attention inside and focus on it. Where do you notice it? What does it feel like? What is its consistency? Is it heavy? Is it dark? Is it dense? Is it light? Is it buzzing? Is it vibrating? Is it tense? What is it? And can you see it? So flesh it out is number three. Flesh it out. Can you see it? If so, how does it look? If not, that's okay. How do you experience it? What is it like? How close are you to it? So what are the sensations in your body related to it? Um, what is the um, description that you would give it? You don't want to focus too much on words. You want to feel what it is and tune into that. Not roll around in it. Just tune into it, okay? How close are you to it? You know, how intense is it? Number four, how do you feel towards the part? This is so similar to the acorn technique. And I didn't even know about IFS when I came up with the acorn technique. I mean, I wasn't as familiar with it. But um, it says the question is our Geiger counter for self-energy. <laughs> That's a weird way of putting it. But basically, 
feel how it feels is your indicator of what's going on in your body which tells you what's going on with the parts and with your mind and the self so any answer that is not in the ballpark of the eight c's the qualities of self energy curiosity calm clarity connectedness confidence courage creativity and compassion means that a second part is influencing our thoughts So we ask the second part if it's willing to relax so we can talk to the target part. If it's not willing to relax, we ask it what it needs for us to know. So you don't get in any hurry. You take a step back. If there's a protective part like a manager or a firefighter there, listen to it. Don't say, get out of my way. It's so easy to do that. It's so frustrating. I know from experience. It's frustrating. But you've got to learn to slow down and listen to all these parts. Treat them equally. Treat them with compassion. Treat them with those eight C's that we're talking about. The process may lead us to a second or third or fourth target part. (laughs) Great, huh? So you just keep going through this process and anything that's trying to protect what's trying to come up from your core at that moment. And then reactive parts often need to feel heard and validated. So be patient. Hear them. Listen to them. Validate them. You don't have to get bogged down. You don't have to fall into whatever it is that the part is expressing. But sort of from a higher but kinder place, go to the level of that part and listen. And it says we stay with them until they are willing to let us go to the target part. So you'll just be like, hey, do you mind stepping back right now and letting me talk to this other part, the the, um, exile that you want to get to? And if they say no, talk about why. Ask them and just be kind. Don't be like, why? But be more like, okay, well, let's talk about that. Why? What do you think is going to happen? And you can reassure them and calm them down. And once you feel like that part backs up and then the other part, any other parts that are protective back up, it says, once they agree, we ask the client, how do you feel towards the target part now? Ask yourself how you feel towards this part. Number six, befriend. Befriend the part by finding out more about it. The fifth step involves learning about the target part, that usually an exile part, and developing a friendly relationship. This builds relationships internally, self to part, and externally, part to therapist if you're with a therapist. How did you get this job? How effective is the job? In other words, what's the part doing? What purpose is it serving? Why is it coming up now? And so on. If it didn't have to do this job, what would it rather do? How old is it? Some of these questions sound kind of ridiculous, but they're actually not. And with the how old it is, don't overthink it. Whatever comes up, just accept it. And sometimes I even wonder, am I just making crap up? And, you know, maybe, but a lot of times there is actually something to this and it takes you back to an age where something came up in your childhood, some kind of childhood trauma, probably, that, or even later in your life, that goes back to a core wound And you're actually healing and working on that core wound because you're going back, 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 deeper, deeper, deeper in your mind and your body. How old does it think you are? And then you can remind that part. I am a grown, you know what, woman or man. And I am 35 or 45 or 55 years old, whatever the case may be. Reminding it of that. And I have got your back. Saying things like that to those hurt inner child parts is so effective. What else does it want you to know? And then number six is the last part. What does this part fear? What does it want from you? What would happen if it stopped doing its job? That makes some people panic, but that is the core question out of all of them. What would happen if this um, fear, if this um, thing, if this part stopped doing its job? You'll get stumped, but you have to keep gently asking it that question. What would happen if it stopped doing its job? And then listen to the answer because that's where your healing is. Your part, if you reassure that it can just be a kid, that inner child part, and it can rest and it doesn't have to deal with any of this and that you will deal with this. God will help you deal with this. Tell your part that. And That's how you get those parts to calm down. That's how you get it to heal. That's how you heal the trauma at the core by using this strategy. So this is the PESI article. I'm not even sure what PESI stands for, but it's P-E-S-I. 
and I couldn't find an acronym. But the six F's are find, focus, flesh, feel, befriend, and fear. So those are the steps to um, actually go through this process. And like I said, it's a little involved. So doing it with a therapist at first is better. Or you can get a book. Or you can look at the article and do this in a journal. Or you can study this really deep and then meditate on it. A guided meditation would be good. You know what? Richard Schwartz has some meditations on Insight Timer that are free. You might check those out. I've got my meditations on Insight Timer as well. It's an app for meditation and stuff. It's called Insight Timer. There's a lot of stuff on there you may not want to do, but there's a lot of good stuff on there too. So you just have to discern like anywhere else. Um, But yeah, Um, Richard Schwartz has meditations on it. You can also look on YouTube to find resources that will probably take you through the steps. And there are probably even courses out there that will guide you through it as well. So maybe I'll make a course on it one day. No promises. I'm not an expert. But I could probably guide you through some of this with a course at some point in the future, maybe. So should Christians do IFS? Um, I looked it up and there's all kinds of Christian therapists teaching IFS and I um, just studying IFS and seeing it. The only pitfall that some people might be concerned about is this whole focus on the self. And But it's not a focus on a self that's selfish and self-absorbed and all out to for the self only. That's not what it's about. It's about establishing for the first time or reestablishing a sense of core identity that all human beings need to have. And even if you have a relationship with God, even if you deny yourself and take up your cross and follow Christ, I don't think deny yourself means don't have an autonomous self. I don't think it means don't be a person with agency and free will. God gave us those things as a gift and abuse is wrong. And so getting yourself back and setting boundaries with people and having a core self and establishing that, even the Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. It assumes that there is a self. I'm not going to dwell on that, but do I think Christians can do IFS? There's a lot of things where I'll say, use your discernment in this one. I'll say that too. If you don't feel like it's something you should do, then don't do it. Pray about it and use discernment. Ask God for his guidance. But I believe that there's nothing wrong with IFS and that it can help change your life if it's a therapy that works for you. Not everything works for everybody experiment with it. Give it a chance. If it doesn't work, there's a hundred other things you can do and that's okay. Okay. So my experience with IFS therapy in my own healing, um, a little bit of experience here. Um, I've told you if you've listened to my past episodes about my crazy neighbors across the street, maybe that's not the most Christian thing to call them, but pardon my French, but Um, there's just no other term to call it except that those people were crazy and they made my life a living hell. And, um, I tried everything, everything. And this had come from PTSD. I don't want to get into my whole childhood, but I grew up in a situation where there was a lot of trauma, a lot of chaos. I did not have control over my environment. Things were constantly changing in my living environment. It was unpredictable. I had no control over it. And then when I expressed concerns about it, Um, They were disregarded. I was told I was selfish and all they did was re-traumatize me even more. And this happened over and over and over again until I was filled with panic attacks, terror, and my deepest fear was losing control over my environment. I've done a lot of work on myself so I know this stuff, right? And so um, what happened was in some previous experiences, I had some terrible neighbors. I had some that were worse than these people across the street, believe it or not. They were absolutely horrible. And I mean, they would have like their barking dog 10 feet from my window at every hour of the day and night. He barked nonstop and he was like a Labrador. So he was like the loudest dog breed bark there is except for maybe two or three others. And I am an HSP, which means I'm highly sensitive. I have a touch of misophonia, which is mean, which means that there are just certain sounds I cannot tolerate, period. Loud, abrupt, constant sounds will literally give me a nervous breakdown. And um, this dog was so loud that um, I had two industrial fans in my bedroom. I had them turned on high 24 hours a day. I had earplugs in my ears, those thick kind, constantly, and I could still hear the dog barking. Long story short, I almost died. I know that sounds insane, but if you have trauma, you know that's not crazy. And if you compound that with being highly sensitive, 
the point is, is that pattern began repeating. And I had these neighbors, move, when I moved to this better house after living here a few years, they moved across the street. They would play their bass loud enough that I could hear it blasting my windows in the back of my house and they would rattle. And I mean, these houses are not close together like the old place I lived at. The houses are probably 70 or 80 feet apart and the acreage is like two thirds of an acre per house. It's kind of spread out a little bit. And that's how loud they were. They would play their basketball at like one in the morning. And um, I would ask them to please turn the music down. They would turn it down, and then they would start doing the same thing two weeks later. There was one Christmas holiday that my husband and I, to get any peace and quiet day or night, had to leave the house to, to get any peace and quiet. And nobody would ever say anything. None of the neighbors. The whole point is that every time they would start turning their music on, I would start shaking, and I would start crying, and I would have a full-blown panic attack. And sometimes the panic attack was so bad that the physical symptoms from it would put me in the bed for a week. And I had these severe PTSD triggers and these just fits of terror, and I don't know what else to call them. And so IFS... I would talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk through this over and over and over. Every time, the most of the time, the noise came from this one teenage girl. And I don't want to say anything bad about her, okay? Let's just not do that. But let's just say that this girl is not getting an upbringing. And I'll leave it at that. No upbringing at all. And this girl was the cause of most of the noise. Well, then on top of that, they got her a subwoofer with flashing lights. And then on top of that, they got her a four-wheeler. Well, that wasn't enough, so they decided, let's get two more. And they would ride them up and down the road in the neighborhood, which is illegal here. And if you've ever heard a four-wheeler, they are ungodly loud. You, They would go in circles, and I could hear them in every room in my house because they were surrounding me. And they would do this for like six or eight hours straight. So you understand why I started having panic attacks and what I call terror attacks, which is like panic attacks times three. And so when I started working with IFS, I couldn't, I would just hear a pin drop and I would have a panic attack. That's how bad it got. And I started bringing it slowly down. Fortunately, things are better now. God willing, they'll stay that way. But the point is, is I started getting this under control where I could at least manage and I could be okay. And I knew I had the skills and the, 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 the um, wherewithal. It was the first time that I felt like I had what I needed inside of me and I didn't have to reach out for something else other than God. And so the IFS therapy, I would talk through it. Um, the, my therapist would say, how do you feel when that girl goes outside? And I'd say, I'd start to panic. And then he would go to the part that was talking and we would work with that part. And he would remind me that myself is a grown woman at a, a certain age and that she has agency and she can leave and she has choices and she has options. And it would just calm that down slowly, slowly, slowly with each iteration. And I'm still working on it and I use IFS for other things intermittently. But IFS has done so much for me and I just wanted to share that experience so you know that it's worked in somebody's life, in this person's life in my life. So, um, does it work from my experience? Yes, very much so. It's iterative. And what iterative means is that you do it over and over and over and over and over. It, iteration is like one time of doing something. And then another iteration is another time of doing something. And so it's like that. That's the nature of it. You do it over and over just like any other kind of healing work. It's what you do over the long term regularly that reprograms your mind and your body from healing um, I mean, to heal um, trauma, abuse, other emotional issues or conditions. So yes, it works. And so um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about my experience with it in a nutshell, but kind of not in a nutshell too. And I wanted you to learn a little bit about how, how IFS works, some of the steps, and where it came from and so the exercises that you can use are the six steps one which is the six f's i'll put the pessy article in the um in the show notes and you can use that one you can also look up a different article if you find one that appeals to you more because you can find these six steps all over the place and some of these other steps show it just not in this detail now, when it comes to exercises, the six Fs are, is the main IFS process protocol. So keep that in mind. Use the six Fs. 
and go through that process and find resources that will help you in a way that works for you, whether that's a book, a course, a meditation. You might check out Dr. Schwartz's meditations on Insight Timer, a YouTube video with Dr. Schwartz or somebody else who does this stuff. And then <clears throat> there's another article in positivepsychology.com. And this one is very comprehensive. It breaks down um, internal family systems in more detail. I just wanted to give you a basic. That was basic, yeah, and that was a lot, right? Um, but it's there are six internal family systems therapy worksheets. And I think these are directed towards therapists, but I don't see any reason why you can't do these on your own. It has the six Fs, and then it also has other exercises you can do, identifying your parts through drawing, identifying managers and firefighters. What is the self what it is and what it isn't in IFS therapy. Um, there's a video here also that I'll share where it's Richard Schwartz talking about what IFS therapy is and he basically gives a summary of it and how it works. So I'll include that as a resource and you can sort of have an audio visual of it to reinforce these ideas. Um, but it then it talks about top two IFS exercises for your sessions, and I don't see any reason why you can't do these on yourself. I think this is directed towards therapists. But one of them is called the Path of Self, and it says this exercise uses visualization to explore self and self-energy. Again, we're not talking about being self-centered here. We're talking about identity, about core autonomy, about, be, about who you are, and using the metaphor of a journey. And then it asks your client to go through all these steps, or in this case, you. So you might do this with a journal. That might be the best way to do it, or through speaking it out. Then the other exercise is called the fire drill. Sounds kind of drastic, but it says the following reflective exercise is a valuable way to revisit parts in life and learn self-leadership through practice and experience. And then again, it gives you steps that the client would go through with the therapist. And you could do this on your own by journaling it. Or you may even find an exercise somewhere online, like on YouTube, that'll take you through this as well. Or an exercise or a course or a book. So... Um, some of this does require a little bit of self-initiation, but I've provided the resources as well. Now, resources from Positive Psychology, they actually include some resources like a vision board, rate behavior rather than self, um, I Will Survive, Easing Empathy Distress, From Inner Critic to Inner Coach Meditation. Um, so there's some resources here. They go on and on um, in references, and that's in the Positive Psychology article called Internal Family Systems Therapy, Eight Worksheets and Exercises. And that's by Jeremy Sutton, PhD, and reviewed by Joe Nash, PhD. Okay, I'll put that in the show notes. So that is just an overview of some exercises you can do and refer to, and there are different ways you can do those. Experiment with it and see what works. But the six F is where you really want to start. Do the six Fs. Get comfortable with that. Start with that. And then maybe try some of these other exercises. The six Fs is the core practice for IFS, internal family systems. So look up Dr. Richard Schwartz. There's a lot of great resources out there. I'll include all of these resources in the show notes. Um, but some other resources, the articles listed here, the Very Well Mind, the Psych Central, Psychology Today are articles that are good foundations for basic information on IFS. Richard Schwartz's books are good, and the one that I recommend starting with, if you want to, is called No Bad Parts. No Bad Parts, and I will put uh, a link to that in Amazon at least, um, and that's by Richard Schwartz. Other resources are those exercises. You can look up your own resources. Um, one thing here, I got a book for therapists on IFS because I wanted to learn more about it and do it more on my own. And it was a snooze fest. It was a snooze fest. And I was like, ugh. So I would encourage you, if you want to do this, don't get the ones that are for therapists. Get the ones that are for patients and for clients. 
And even if you're not seeing a therapist, it would still use that terminology. And it will explain it in layman's terms, and it will give you ways you can practice on yourself and get more out of the practice with a therapist if you work with a therapist. But you can do it on your own. And No Bad Parts by Richard Schwartz. Honestly, I haven't read that one. I've read some other books. But that one comes highly recommended. I've read a lot of good reviews on it. I've heard people say that it was very helpful for them. So I think that you could... And he's the original guy that made it. So... Um, you could start there and that'd probably be pretty good. So those are some resources as well as the positive psychology article. We'll give you all kinds of linked resources in that article and exercises as well. Okay, so this has been a long podcast, but I wanted to make sure that we covered IFS, what it does, how it's set up, how it can help you heal, and specific steps you can take to use this therapy to learn about it and maybe to even do this with a therapist. So you can have the healing that you deserve. So this is the end of episode two, season three of Christian Emotional Recovery. Thank you so much for following me on this somewhat detailed and involved topic. And I hope you learned something and found a new strategy that you can use that can help you heal narcissistic abuse, trauma, childhood trauma, childhood emotional neglect, um, emotional issues of any kind, and recovery with those and so forth and so on. So keep in mind, check out my YouTube channel. The YouTube channel is listed in the show notes. It's got different stuff that you can learn about your healing process than you can find in the podcast for the most part. And also keep in mind the podcast is in the YouTube channel. Please click subscribe. You can also find my Facebook channel, which is also called Christian Emotional Recovery. The YouTube channel is called Christian Emotional Recovery. Of course, check out the podcast. Check out Instagram with the same name, ChristianEmotionalRecovery.com, where you can find other resources. And check out my store, which I will link in the show notes as well. And if you're interested in writing, sign up for one of my courses. I've got free courses on writing too, if you're interested. So check that out. And it has been a privilege talking to you today. I hope you've gotten a lot. Remember, beloved, you are fearfully and wonderfully made and God loves you.